Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. And today I've got Colin Herdman. And he's going to, he is a lifelong entrepreneur building businesses. He's got a really interesting slant in terms of entrepreneurship. He's going to talk about rise of the non-technical entrepreneur, um, five stages of scaling, shared success agreement, and um, really happy to have his insights and thoughts on the show. So Colin, welcome. Yeah, thanks so much, Christopher. Really appreciate you having me. Yeah, so kind of give a background, how you got started, what you do, and we'll dive right into the conversation. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Well, I have a pretty interesting background, actually. I started my first business a week after graduating from college with a criminal justice degree. So I never took a business marketing or accounting class and uh, pretty much just trial by fire ever since. I've never had to make a resume and I've just been making it up as I've gone along. Um, the first company I had for a little over a, a decade and I ended up selling that company. And then uh, in 2007, I started Monkey Island Ventures with two buddies of mine. We've all known each other since we were about five years old. And Monkey Island is the name of a park that we used to play at when we were kids uh, yeah. here in the Twin Cities uh, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. So we leaned really heavily into tech. Uh, we were building software um, and have probably built uh, over a, you know a dozen software products over the years. Um, we did a, a Kickstarter and built a smart water meter and got funded uh, and then we've also built two uh, service businesses. One um, is a digital marketing company and the other is a software development company. Um, we have a team uh, here in the U.S. of around 40 people and also use some international talent as well. So, uh, yeah, it's been it's been a great ride. Really have enjoyed uh, the journey and doing it with two of my best friends. Um, so, yeah, happy to take it in a number of different directions. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that uh, we talked about in the back room was, you know, this idea of the rise of non-technical entrepreneur. And uh, I'm just yeah. curious about trends and talk about the new era it's ushering in. Yeah, no, happy to. So there's uh, three things we see that are happening um, all at the same time that are really giving non-technical entrepreneurs the opportunity to scale technology-based businesses. And we're mostly talking about software here. And what we're seeing is the rise of low code or no code tools, okay? So any of us, whether we're technical or not, could start building our software idea using low code, no code software, okay? There's there's just been a plethora of these new products that are out there to really help us non-technical entrepreneurs build the products that we're envisioning. Uh, and so what I will say, there is a caveat to that, and one of the things you want to make sure you do is keep your um, kind of guardrails really tight around your pain or product idea that you're trying to to solve for, uh, because it's really easy to get, uh, you know, kind of wide eyes and build something. Uh, one of the things we talk or overbuild something, one of the things we talk about is how it's never been easier to build software, but it's also never been easier to overbuild. Okay, so you really need to be honed in on what it is that you want to build. But these low code, no code tools can do that. The other thing to say about them is they, you may have to cobble a couple of them together, um, and you may find that you only get eighty or ninety percent of the way there, and you might need to hire someone to kind of fill that last gap. So um, our software development company, Cloudburst, really acts as like a mentor or a guide um, in helping non technical entrepreneurs think about how they need to build out their product. So the second thing is international talent. So you can find technical talent to aid you and you can use, you know, platforms like Upwork and you can find international talent at a much lower cost that can do exactly what you need it to do. The only problem with that is because you're not technical, you're kind of beholden to them. So you don't really know if the code they're creating is correct. You don't really know if kind of the way that they're envisioning your product is totally accurate. So there can be some issues there um, around language and culture, as well as just ensuring you have alignment. Uh, but you can get low cost talent and really go a long way um, using international talent. And the third is AI. Of course, um, AI is, is is assisting technical and non-technical uh, alike in building um, products. So those three things, low code, no code, international talent, and AI are really helping non-technical entrepreneurs start moving their, their technical ideas and especially software forward. Yeah. 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 Really, um, really fascinating. And, um, and I love this idea because, you know, a lot of these, um, uh, you know, before, like you had the 
you know, blogging, you had to know these codes, but now you had like WordPress and, uh, you know, Wix, you can, you know, create it is and it's yep. all the code is running in the background. So, um, you no, know, kind of my next question is, um, this idea of uh, the five stages of scaling and, yeah. uh, talk about how entrepreneurs can use that to grow their business. Yeah. Yep. No, that's a, that's a, it's a <laughs> great question. And, and I find this to be really compelling <laughs> in that these five stages of growth through through software uh, is really a way for uh, any entrepreneur, whether you have a business or not, but especially those that also have have an ongoing business, um, to really scale through technology in ways that weren't possible in the past. So, um, the first stage of scaling uh, your business um, with software is having a vision, right? The the entrepreneur, it's up to you to have the vision to understand the pain that you're trying to solve and uh, be able to communicate that to whoever it is that you're working with um, to get that product built. Um, or if you were going to build it yourself through low code, no code, um, being able to articulate that vision so you know what it is you're going to build. The second stage is giving that product to your team and or your customers so they can begin giving feedback on what they like and what they don't like, and that you can start getting provable data points that these these audiences actually want and value the product that you're building. And so again, you 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 want to have a really narrow focus. You want to hone very specifically in on the pain points that you're trying to solve. And you want to get that product out in the hands of your users as fast as you can. It should be ugly. It shouldn't be perfect. There should be probably some issues with it that maybe you don't tell people about right away, but that you just want to get in their hands and see if it's really solving a pain. If you can prove that it is helping your team and or customers, then move on to stage three. And stage three is where your product should be helping you close sales. It should be helping you close deals. You should be able to go to the marketplace and say, hey, this is my company. This is what we do. Oh, and by the way, we have this unique software product that does something that our competitors don't have. And it provides these types of benefits to you. And you should be able to show then that, your software is helping you close deals because of the unique value that it's providing your company. If you can show that your software works, and not only that, but it's also helping you differentiate and close business, then you move on to stage four, which is really the dream for any entrepreneur, which is if you're able to show those things, you've now added more value to your company and you've probably added a multiple to the value of your business. So any investor or anyone that might want to buy your business sees your business in a different light than your competitors because you provide these services or products, but you also have a layer of uniqueness, which is the software that is providing these efficiencies or these benefits to your team and or customers. So that's stage four. And a lot of entrepreneurs stop there, but there's a stage five. And the stage five is if you have solved these pain points for your business, it's it's highly likely that you've solved the same pain points for others within your industry. And so stage five is putting your software out as a software as a service product, as a SaaS product into your industry and allowing other companies that do the same type of work that your company does to start benefiting from that software as well. And that is where you start to achieve mass potential in in uh, profits and also scale because now you're scaling on software you're not just scaling on people and so that's really what stage five is all about where you're choosing to scale a technology company as a with a SaaS product into your industry and so those are the five <clears throat> stages of scaling through software yeah interesting how you talked about scaling through people and scaling through software um mm -hmm. and it just it reminds me you know i guess well scaling through software is infinitely more than with people um for non talk no, for sorry for non-technical entrepreneurs looking to build software what mm -hmm. strategies and resources would you recommend and um to make sure they bring their vision to life without that technical background yeah i mean the number one thing that i would recommend is you know start talking to people that uh have developed uh product uh, and that could be true for both low code, no code, or maybe you actually want to talk to people like us at, at, at Cloudburst. It doesn't cost you anything to talk to different development companies and see what their philosophies are and how they build software. Uh, you're going to learn a lot. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, you might even want to start dabbling in kind of low code, no code tools and see, um, you know, what you can start to build. There's also lots of uh, startup uh, communities in most cities uh, where you could go and, and meet other people, um, you know, in the flesh and actually talk to other people and see what their experiences are. Um, we actually just started last month something something called no code coffee here in Minneapolis. <laughs> And we're charging, I think, twenty or twenty-five dollars for a ticket. Uh, start going from seven a.m. to nine a.m. And we had thirty people show up for our very first one. So we had a speaker there that had built their product on low-code, no-code technology, and now we're starting to scale a real company. And uh, so there are uh, local meetups that you could start getting involved in as well. But if you're really passionate about a problem that you've already identified and you believe that software is a way for you to address that pain point, uh, I would say look at low-code, no-code tools and start talking to people that could actually start helping you understand you know, what it might actually take to, to build a product um, if you want to go down more of the custom software road. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, one thing that's really interesting in your bio is that you've... Um, you know, built companies with your um, two best friends. I mean, I don't like my, my best friends. I are probably from uh, med school residency. You know, yeah. but it's great that. Um, so, how do you? You know, how do you? Uh, what is your? Because your uh, business partnership, most business partnerships I I see have failed, and people yeah. just go their way. How do you? What What are the key factors to success? Yeah. So um, we have something called the five F's. OK, so it's friendship, family, freedom, finances and fun. Okay? Those are our five F's. We have always put our personal relationships and our families ahead of our businesses. Um, and I think it also helps that we've known each other since we were five years old. So we know each other <laughs> as well as anyone knows us. And. <clears throat> So we have literally um, shared blood, sweat, tears, laughs, and, you know, all of it. Uh, so you have to uh, just ensure that the people that you're going into business with are people that you can trust implicitly, that the foundation of what you're building um, is your personal relationships first and business second. There are, we, we, we have failed more businesses than we've succeeded with, um, and, you know, very rarely is one decision going to cost you your business? And so, you know, you have to just choose what hills you're willing to die on. And also just don't don't take things, you know, so seriously. You have to, yes, business is serious, but at the same time, uh, you know, you take it too seriously and you're going to, you know, lose all the joy in life. So uh, <laughs> you know, that's one of the things I think for, for Josh, Zach and I, is we've always just put you know, our friendship and our relationship uh, before before business. And um, we're we're in it, yes, to make money, but we're also in it because we want to enjoy the experience um, together. And part of that enjoyment is even going through the really, really hard times where things have really just kind of sucked and being able to rely on one another and being able to use each other's energies and, and build off of that. And, uh, you know, I've had you know, uh, business in the past uh, where I was kind of, you know, alone at the top. And that's that's a really hard thing. So um, if you're able to go into business with friends and go into eyes wide open in the ways that I've explained, uh, I think it's it's worth it. Yeah, really interesting. And it, it almost reminds me of, um, you know, like you have a, like a marriage, which is also a partnership. But then you also, oh. I know like my good friend from college, you know, he, he chose to focus on, creating really great business partnerships, you know, very similar to marriage, but in a different context. Yeah. But um, yeah. talk about shared success agreement, because I know you yeah. you taught, you focused that and um, yeah. what, uh, what is it and, and how can how can the audience apply it or use it? So the shared success agreement is something that um, my business partner, Zach, invented, and it really came from uh, an experience that we had. Uh, so going back to one of our first products that we developed, it was called Local Tweeps. And it was in the early days of Twitter. And it took us about a month to build. And the Twitter product is you would log into our product with your Twitter account. You would um, put in your zip code. And then it would associate you with that zip code city and state. And then a tweet would go through your account. And it would say, 
Um, hey, everybody, I just signed up um, on local tweets at zip code 55418. Uh, you should sign up too. And we got this viral loop and we ended up signing up 30,000 users in two days. We were a trending topic on Twitter and it was just an yeah. amazing experience. We didn't make any money on it because we had no monetization model. So that parlayed yeah. into a product that we built called SMB Tweet. Uh, okay, so SMB Tweet is a product that we built to help uh, like local retail uh, get a Twitter following. Uh, so, you know, like a coffee shop, right? They want Twitter followers that could walk in and actually buy a coffee. That's what they care about. And so we had an algorithm. Our product then would, over time, generate a large continuing growing audience um, for these local retail establishments. But Josh, Zach, and I don't write code. So we had to hire a developer. And the developer that we hired <laughs> said, I know you guys are in bootstrap mode, said my normal hourly rate is $100 an hour. He said, I'll charge you $50 an hour to build your MVP. But once your MVP is built and you start generating revenue, I want 10% of your revenue to go back to me and pay me out at $150 an hour for all the hours that I put in. And we said that yeah. sounds like a good deal. So he built our MVP. He got paid $50 an hour uh, to build our MVP. Then we started generating revenue through that product. And we paid him out at $150 an hour on all the hours that he put into the project. So he got an additional income stream coming into him and he didn't have to put in any more time. And then for us, we got our MVP built and we didn't have to give up any equity. And so what, what um, CloudBirth did, our software development company, is we ended up uh, adopting and creating what's called a shared success agreement, which allows a owner or founder to create an agreement with a service provider, and it could be accounting, it could be legal, it could be marketing, it could be software development. But really, the the, the service provider is discounting their services for a share of future revenue. And so if you go to sharedsuccessagreement.org, anyone can go and create these agreements for free. We don't make any money on it. It's just a, it's just a, a new kind of alternative to debt or equity or crowdfunding that we think really creates a win-win between the two parties. Um, and one other little caveat is you can also raise money through a um, shared success agreement. So uh, you could also have someone give you money through a shared success agreement, and um, it works under the crowdfunding equity laws. Uh, so uh, when you use the, there's a calculator on the site, so you can play around with with different fields and numbers. There's only like five fields. It's very simple. And when you submit it, a Word document will get emailed to you with all the legalese in there. And then you just go in and you do any fine tuning between you and the other party. But it's great on the founder side because you can get service providers that come in um, at a discount for a share of future revenue. But it's also great for service providers because you may want to work with the client and maybe they don't have uh, the money to pay your full rate, but maybe you use a shared success agreement as a way to begin to establish a relationship. So it's super simple. It's really easy. You don't have to worry about, you know, value evaluations and cap tables and all these other things. So um, if anyone ends up using one, please let us know. We'd love to hear your story and how you use it. Yeah, I really, really interesting. Um, and then kind of to um, end it out, what, what is this Ladders of Wealth creation and how can people contact you and find out more about you? Your ideas are really interesting. Yeah, so I'll, I'll end it on two notes here. So one is, um, if you just enter ladders of wealth creation into Google, uh, you'll get an art an article that comes up. Um, and Nathan, the guy that uh, created ConvertKit, which is like a hundred million dollar SaaS company, uh, he wrote this article like five years ago. And the article is all about how you move up these four ladders um, in terms of business models, and uh, it's done in a very simple yet. Uh, informative way that really helps any entrepreneur think about building a more profitable and a more scalable business. The one thing to just note is each ladder, as you jump across each ladder, it's more difficult to achieve success. And as you go up each ladder, each rung on the ladder is also more difficult to, to move up to. But um, that, that Ladders of Wealth Creation article really goes into some detail explaining the different ladders and the different rungs and and how you create more profitable and more scalable businesses uh so i think it's a it's a great read for anyone and then the last thing i'll say is in terms of just like my entrepreneurial road we're, we're very 
fluid in terms of like where we see opportunities and um, something that um, we are now more publicly launching is a uh, kind of this, uh, uh, what I'm terming like an authentic automation platform called Rainmaker. Um, and it's all built on top of LinkedIn. So if you go to rainmakergrows.com, um, you can start to learn about uh, the different ways of leveraging LinkedIn to grow your network, your leads, and your sales using what I'm terming authentic automation and all these different ways of, of growing um, growing your business. So um, that's something that I'm spending a lot more of my time on now. Really, really excited uh, about that. So if anyone has any questions, they can certainly find me on LinkedIn, Colin Herdman, and um, you can see uh, monkeyislandventures.com. Um, not adventures, but ventures, monkeyislandventures.com. And that shows all the different companies that we have and more of our story. would love to talk to anyone uh, that is on or thinking about the entrepreneurial journey. I would be more than happy to give some time and, and help out however I can. Yeah, really interesting. And I really love your ideas about scaling and using software. Um, and uh, for all the audience, let's thank uh, Colin for coming on and sharing his ideas. And be sure to give his company a like and follow his socials. And thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much, Christopher. Appreciate it.